instruments. Check and set. Green 2 is good. What are your plans for the future? Well, I plan to be flying United 747 yeah. heavies. Prior to going to Hampton University, I had never met a black airline pilot. If you see it, you can achieve it. That's a real thing. And so us together, we maybe didn't see it outside of us, but us, we could see it in each other. And we're flying. It's all about this. We knew that it was going to be a little more difficult for us because of our skin color. And we wanted to make sure that that was not going to be the obstacle, that we were going to be the best we could be or even better than others. It's incredible that we are in a position now to affect the trajectory of the next generation's path. I think travel in general for young African Americans to just go to another state or even go to another country and experience what other people have to offer in different cultures, it opens up a world for that individual. AVA is a great program that United has put together and it will help increase diversity in the cockpit. The fact that we all ended up here at United is kind of like a storybook ending because this is where we all dreamt of being. This dream has gone beyond our love of flying. This has become a love for each other. We're always there for each other and always will be. Good afternoon from Chicago. Thank you for joining us for the second virtual gathering of the Pritzker Forum on Global Cities. The Pritzker Forum is a partnership of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and the Financial Times. And we've been so pleased to be able to host it together since 2015. Our annual gatherings have traditionally brought together the world's leading experts to explore how cities can address global challenges. From climate change to income and wealth inequality, to terrorism and transnational threats. But of course, for the past year, the world and our cities have been rocked by another major global challenge, the COVID pandemic. Last October, we assembled in our new virtual format to explore how cities could reimagine governance during a global pandemic. We looked at how cities around the world were delivering services to residents during a lockdown. And we focused on the interplay between local and national leadership in responding to the pandemic. Today, we bring you the second installment of our new digital format. We're in a new year and at a time of new leadership in the United States. 
This is a time for cautious optimism, even hope. We now have more Americans who are vaccinated than we have confirmed cases of COVID in the United States. Vaccine supplies are increasing around the United States, and the first shipments of vaccines are arriving in developing countries thanks to the global effort of the COVAX Alliance. We're in a period that feels hopeful, but, and it's important, we're not out of the woods yet. We must continue to be vigilant. There are multiple new variants of the virus, continuing challenges to vaccine distribution, and we are seeing the troubling emergence of a new vaccine nationalism. And of course, the long-term impact of the pandemic goes beyond the immediate health of people. The virus has highlighted existing inequalities in our cities, disproportionately affecting the most vulnerable among us. As we prepare to rebuild back better, we look to new efforts, led in many instances by cities, to ensure that the recovery itself addresses long-standing inequities, racial, gender, socioeconomic, and other inequalities. Today, we will take a deep dive into equity and cities, from pursuing more equitable health and economic outcomes, to examining the role our transit systems play in ensuring equal access and opportunity for all. We will hear from an amazing roster of speakers. Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, who chairs the Biden-Harris Task Force on Health Equity, will be with us, as will Dr. Anthony Fauci, Senior Medical Advisor to President Biden and Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Joining us as well is the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, and we're fortunate to have with us the mayors from Bristol, Cape Town, Los Angeles, New Orleans, and London. Today's program and the year-round work we do on Global Cities is made possible by the generous support of our partners and sponsors, the Pritzker Family and Foundation, our lead sponsors, AbbVie and UL, our supporting sponsors, Kirkland and Ellis and United Airlines, and of course, by the Robert R. McCormick Foundation. Our thanks to them and to each of you for watching and taking the time to join us today. And now, it is my great pleasure to welcome our co-host, the U.S. editor of the Financial Times, Peter Spiegel. Peter, we've greatly appreciated our collaboration over the years on global cities and the insights from the Financial Times on the pandemics and what it means for cities. Great to have you here, Peter. Thanks very much, Evo. Ever since the Financial Times joined with the Chicago Council to launch the Pritzker Forum on Global Cities more than five years ago, I've always viewed these conferences as a rare chance to celebrate urbanism. Cities can be easy targets, particularly for those who don't live in them. And for even those of us who live in Brooklyn or, or Lincoln Park, we can find them maddening places sometimes, filled with snarled transportation hubs, long DMV lines, and overpriced restaurants. But what has made the Pritzker Forum so unique, and to me enjoyable, has been for all our city's faults, we've been able to highlight how they've served as bulwarks against some of the most disturbing recent political and economic trends. At a time of rising nationalism and chauvinism, they have continued to embrace immigration and multiculturalism. As national leaders in the US and Europe have peddled protectionism, they have been champions of free trade and globalization. And when white supremacy became a shockingly mainstream political movement, cities provided fertile ground for the growth of the Black Lives Matter campaign. But even those of us who are inclined to celebrate our cities must admit the last year has been a difficult one for urbanism. The pandemic and its associated economic crisis, as well as the racial justice issues thrown into stark relief by the Black Lives Matter protests, have not put our cities in the best of light. Racial and ethnic minorities in our cities have suffered from COVID disproportionately and then struggled to get vaccinated. Police forces in our biggest cities have continued to protect and defend officers in their ranks with clear track records of excessive violence against African-Americans. And the economic downturn has thrown a disproportionate number of Blacks and Latinos out of work, particularly in our cities, where service-based industries like restaurants and hotels continue to suffer. Which is why I want to add my voice to Evo's in thanking today's panelists for joining us to discuss how, to borrow that phrase from President Biden, we can build back better not just economically, not just healthily, but with equity 
for all of us who make cities our home. One of Chicago's favorite sons, Rahm Emanuel, is often credited with popularizing the phrase, never let a good crisis go to waste. I'll be honest with you, I have always found that saying a bit trite. To me, it absolves our leaders from doing the difficult work of reforming our institutions when they could actually prevent a future crisis. I much prefer John F. Kennedy's admonition to repair the roof while the sun is shining. If we had invested in public health networks before the pandemic, if we had rooted out bad apples in police forces before George Floyd was apprehended, if we had removed barriers to economic opportunity before the lockdown, the last 12 months would have been much, much different. But since we didn't do that roofing repair before the current omni crisis, it is incumbent upon policymakers to tackle these issues as we hopefully return to some semblance of a normal life in the coming months. In many ways, we are now forced to take Rahm Emanuel's advice. Many of our cities and making them more equitable is a worthy goal, but it's not an easy one. If it were easy, we'd already be doing it, but we are in desperate need of new ideas. I worry that most of the solutions now being discussed revisit policy debates from a distant past. On the left, people are urging a new deal sized expansion of the welfare state. On the right, anti-immigration policies reminiscent of pre-war nativist quota systems are touted nightly on cable news. Is that really all we can offer? A decade after the financial crisis called into question much of what is now known as the Washington Consensus, where are the policy entrepreneurs finding creative solutions for the great radical center that understands the need for change but abhors extremism in all its forms? Shouldn't our cities be the incubators of those solutions? It is a tall order, but let's try to start that conversation here this afternoon. Back to you, Evo. Thank you, Peter, for those insights. Before we move on, I invite you to follow us and engage with us throughout the forum on Twitter at underscore global cities. Now onto our program. The coronavirus pandemic has highlighted persistent inequities in our cities, not least when it comes to communities of color. Here in Chicago, we've seen this connection firsthand. More than 70% of the city's first coronavirus deaths were among African Americans. And the fatality rate for black residents has been between two and three times higher than it has been for the city's white residents. Abvi Pharmaceuticals mobilized in response to the pandemic committing to pursuing racial equity in healthcare. Marginalization is real. Redlining was real. On the south side of Chicago, our residents experienced some of the worst health disparities. We can create a consciousness around the issues that the community face. It's interesting when we talk about um, health equity and health disparities, um, this isn't a new thing, but I think during COVID, I think some of the social justice issues around George Floyd that happened last summer has really brought a lot more attention to some of the challenges around health equity in our, in our country. AbbVie has been one of the founding partners of Direct Release Health Equity Fund, and we're going to work with organizations that are on the ground. They're doing some tremendously great work, but just maybe need a little bit more help to scale it. There is a great deal of distrust in black and brown communities in general of the healthcare system, and it is not unfounded distrust. I never imagined when I started that 30% of health is the clinical information. The majority of it is what happens in your environment. The intent behind the community health worker is to have trusted messengers assisting individuals. Individuals who have a medical professional who looks like them, who they feel comes from a similar background to them, have better outcomes. This new program is really geared toward bringing African-Americans into the workforce for allied health positions. What we're focused on is the provision of opportunity 
and the upending of inequity. We need people who are active in those ways. Everyone's heard the phrase, it takes a village. Wherever you can, extend a hand. We're human beings in this world. Let's be human. What a powerful message and commitment from AFI on a topic so important to our cities and residents. The health disparities AFI is working to address through its philanthropic partnerships aren't unique to Chicago, however. To discuss U.S. efforts to address health equities, I'm pleased to introduce our first moderator, Et Luce, U.S. National Editor of the Financial Times. He will be in conversation with Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, Chair of the Biden-Harris Health Equity Task Force. Thank you very much, Ivo. I'm delighted to be here with Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, who's Associate Professor uh, of Medicine and Epidemiology at the Yale School of Medicine, is in charge there of their health equity research, and is also head of uh, President Biden's task force on um, health equity. Um, so it's a great pleasure to, to be with you, Dr. Nunez-Smith. Um, couldn't think of a better time in America's history than and today of talking about health equity because of what the pandemic has exposed. But of course, there was gross health inequity prior to the pandemic as well. Um, talk to us a little bit about what the pandemic has exposed in terms of inequities in America as a country and as, in its cities. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and so I uh, really appreciate being in conversation with you today. I mean, I think it is uh, so true that as a nation, we've just had a collective witnessing this past year, now year plus. Uh, I think for some people, sadly, it was predictable that we were going to see the patterns we've seen in terms of who's been most affected negatively by COVID-19, both in terms of uh, case burden, as well as hospitalization rates, and sadly, loss of life. And then uh, as a sort of accompanying reality, you know, the economic suffering has also been uneven in our country and those same patterns. But there have been other people, I think, for whom um, there has been a, a, a new understanding and appreciation of just how deep and entrenched the social and structural inequities really are um, and have been and just how much work we have to do. And so, you know, whether or not we uh, have a conversation, as, as I often say, in our country, race and place are just extraordinary drivers of health and health outcomes and often the lack thereof. And so we see the overrepresentation, for example, of people of color in some of these jobs that have been deemed essential, really putting themselves and their families at risk, homes that are often multi-generational, where they have family members themselves who are at risk. And whether we talk about the longstanding exposures to environmental toxins, the inability to access high quality health care, all the things that drive those comorbid conditions we so often refer to as increasing one's risk for severity in terms of COVID-19 and its outcomes. You know, we're already seeing disparities in terms of who is living with long COVID and that syndrome of COVID. So there are a lot of implications that have to do with our social structural realities. We're seeing people now as a result of the economic fallout, higher rates of housing, instability, nutrition and food insecurity, and our cities, to your point, you know, 80% of Americans in our cities. And so uh, just critical for us to be able to name now, but more importantly, intervene. Um, if you think of um, where I'm based, and I know where you'll be visiting often, um, the District of Columbia, 45% African-American, 76% of deaths um, from COVID-19 African-American have been African-American, um, but only about a quarter of the vaccinations. And you, you go to sort of other parts of this town, I'm in Northwest, a relatively privileged area, but if you go to less privileged areas, you'll see um, the the lines around the block are more white than you would expect them to be. Um, that there seems to be a problem with getting equity in vaccination rates. How big a problem is is that, um, and and how do you think it's going to be addressed? Yeah, I'm really grateful that you raised this issue in terms of inequity in terms of the vaccine uptake. You know. Absolutely, all of us need to do more. That's not acceptable for the outcomes we need to see. Um, it, it's exactly the way that you framed it, is how I think about it that we 
should be seeing vaccine uptake that is at least in proportion to the representation of of different groups in the overall population, if not skewed, given, as you said, that there are some communities that have been harder hit and are at highest risk. So, you know, there is work to do. I, you know, I often say the conversation is around, you know, access and acceptance. And let me just spend a moment saying uh, something about acceptance. We need to meet people where they are and build confidence in the vaccines. We currently have three three vaccines in the United States that are approved for emergency use. All three of them are very safe and highly effective on the things that we care about, right? Preventing severe illness, hospitalization, and death. So it's just critical that we make sure everybody has the information that they need about the vaccines. But I don't want us to to be um, sort of lulled into thinking that we have a great challenge in terms of people's readiness. You know, I hear much more about people who are eligible and ready. They're at yes and they have a hard time connecting with vaccine. And so we have prioritized in the federal administration making sure that people have access, right? Vaccination needs to be easy, convenient, it's free. But what do we mean by that? You know, we've stood up in the first few weeks and have expanded on these um, several federal programs. So in addition to the vaccine that we, we allocate to states and local jurisdictions, we also have direct federal vaccine allocations to specific programs, such as our community vaccination centers. And those are located in these very communities that are most at risk, right? And so that is using the CDC Social Vulnerability Index to make sure, or we're using best practices, right? Making sure that there are extended hours that you can register through faith and community-based organizations, that there is targeted eligibility. So prioritizing those zip codes as Washington DC has done. And so other best practices, being sure that we are in good partnership to get those vaccines to who most needs them. Same for the retail pharmacy program, a third of those located in high-risk neighborhoods and communities. Also, um, very importantly, our community health center program. And so very specifically reaching out to those healthcare providers that provide service to those people whose lives are in fact, most often very much affected by these social structural inequities. Um, And then we have mobile units to get vaccination to people when needed. So we're very intentional. Um, about access. And we work closely with states and localities to make sure they're very intentional about improving access as well. Um, I want to get onto the state um, and city bit in one second, but just to follow up on that, do you have a sense of um, what share of the problem is to do with lack of access to say, you know, digital broadband so that you can understand when appointments are available and when um, the vaccine, you're eligible for the vaccine, um, versus historic, very, very good reasons for mistrust in public health um, amongst certain minority communities, not just African-American. Um, these are sort of two separate problems, right? Well, yeah, I do think they are, I do think they are linked because I think one of the ways that you kind of address uh, what you have rightly described as a sometimes healthy skepticism um, is by showing up and making access convenient and easy. I mean, you know, to your point, the, the president has acknowledged on more than one occasion that, you know, people of color, others in this country have not really always been treated with the dignity, the respect that they deserve from scientific institutions or from the federal government. And so we have to start there with that acknowledgement. Um, and I think it's really important to say that these institutions have earned the distrust of these communities. And so we don't often have to look at historical context. Unfortunately, people have contemporary examples in their own lives and the lives of people in their family who have sought care potentially um, and experienced you know, bias or mistreatment. So we have to be really clear about acknowledging um, and recognizing that reality. Yet I say, you know, that is not a reason to deny um, oneself, one's family, one's community access to the scientific discovery that is life protecting and preserving, particularly in some of the communities that have been hardest hit. But we absolutely need to acknowledge that. Also need to acknowledge the disinformation and misinformation campaigns that are out there and, I, and, in, and unfortunately are sometimes targeting um, these very communities. And I think that is uh, unacceptable. Uh, and it has a potential to be devastating. So, you know, that's on the one side is, is acknowledging that. But absolutely, the digital divide, as you point out, it's key that people be able, it, it does not need to be a matter of kind of who can connect to the internet fastest, um, you know, who speaks English the best. 
uh, who has the highest degree of tech literacy. All of these are, are challenges that we've seen. We're addressing those. Um, the president just announced being able to centralize some of these resources, both in terms of a website, but also an accessible call center. And very key is being able to coordinate your registration through whoever you trust, whether that be a community-based organization, a faith-based organization, really key that the strategies include ways for people to connect with registration um, that also meet them where they are. So unfortunately, there's only time for one more question. So let me ask you about the uh, this big 1.9 trillion um, pandemic relief bill passed last week, um, which um, includes several hundred billion for cities uh, and state governments. What what impact do you think that's going to have on everything we've been talking about? Yeah, it's going to be transformative. You know, this is a good moment in our country not only because of the scientific discovery we talked about before, you know, being able to have vaccine, also to have many therapeutics. Um, we don't talk about as much, but we have COVID-19 resources that can be brought to bear. And now we have the federal resources to do that. You know, the American Rescue Plan uh, is ambitious and bold because it, it needed to be. That's what the country absolutely needs at this moment. And so, you know, being able to provide directly to over 19,000 cities and towns the resources that they need to be able to carry out vaccination campaigns that will be successful, that will reach all their communities, all their residents, critical. But there's also so much more. Uh, and so transformative is what I would say. I think this is a very, um, very welcome and needed uh, intervention and resources but very hopeful for so many reasons. I mean, we're getting close to being able to see the other side and get to our new normal uh, for so many reasons. And the resources in the ARP, definitely necessary and key in that toolbox. Well, Dr. Nunez Smith, thanks so much for, for joining us and best of luck with your, your very important work. Thank you, be well. Thanks, Ed and Dr. Nunez Smith for that really insightful conversation. While it is important to consider what equitable health access looks like beyond the COVID-19 pandemic here in the United States, we also have much to learn from cities around the globe from tracking their experiences in tackling this critical issue. To address this and other vital matters, I'll now hand the discussion over to Jillian Tett, the FT's U.S. Editor-at-Large, who will moderate today's feature panel with the mayors of Bristol, New Orleans, Los Angeles, and Cape Town. highlighted the fundamental inequalities at the heart of our town and cities. Unfortunately, the vulnerable will continue to be worse affected. come back from COVID, we can't just come back the same. We have to come back better and more equitable. Our cities must lead the way to bridge the inequities and the gaps in society so that everyone can find peace and prosperity and opportunity for a better life. And welcome to a panel discussion with mayors about what equity means both pre and pandemic in urban settings. My name is Gillian Tett, I'm with the Financial Times and we've been proudly working with the Pritzker Forum on Global Cities for several years looking at these crucial questions of equity in cities. Even before pand the pandemic hit, I used to love holding these discussions because mayors have a really important role to play in the wider political economy right now. Although the internet has brought us together in some ways, 
what's happening in our local area has become more important than ever, and the pandemic has reinforced that in both good and bad ways. It has exposed existing inequities, it has intensified them, but in some cases, it's also created energy to try and address bigger structural problems. So what we're gonna hear about now from four amazing mayors is what that means in practice. What are they doing in their different cities to overcome some of the inequities revealed by COVID? Can they use this disruptive shock to actually address the key issues? Or are we simply going to have more of the same, potentially even worse in the future? The mayors we have come from all over the world. We've got Mayor Latoya Cantrell, who's from New Orleans. We've got Mayor Eric Garcetti from Los Angeles. Mayor Dan Plato from Cape Town, sorry, Executive Mayor from Dan Plato from Cape Town. And Mayor Marvin Reith from Bristol, my fellow Brit. So, wide span of cities involved, but probably ch confronting quite similar challenges in some ways. And I'd like to start with you, Mayor Cantrell from New Orleans, because in many ways, you had a dress rehearsal for the pandemic a few years ago with a terrible experience of the hurricane. Um, after the hurricane, you built back better in a very impressive way that really put New Orleans on the map for many people. But I'm curious, um, how has that prepared you or not prepared you to deal with the challenges of COVID? And what can you tell us about how to build back better, better, if you like? Well, you know, thank you again uh, for having me and for the question. Uh, Hurricane Katrina and that aftermath absolutely uh, required us to focus on the disparity gaps that existed in this city, health disparities, but the economic and wealth gaps as well. But building back better in that post-Katrina environment, we have more um, community health clinics in neighborhoods that never existed 15 years ago, which really allowed us in this COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, to build and, and really reach out to those stakeholders that had already been planted in communities and talking about health and testing and mobilizing and meeting people where they are in our communities and neighborhoods was an advantage, I believe, that grew uh, from Hurricane Katrina. And just the focus um, has been very much on our black and brown communities that have been disproportionately impacted. So COVID hit us at a deficit, no doubt about it, but we immediately knew that we had to go into communities where our most vulnerable are and build up those testing sites again so that we can get a handle on the virus and flatten the curve. And we've been able to do that three times now. Have you um, seen any of the disparities between the black and brown communities and the white communities in terms of their susceptibility to COVID-19 or in terms of the vaccine distribution, have you managed to reduce some of the, those inequities? Because on a national level, the, fi the, the figures are very stark. I'm gonna ask, I'll turn to Los Angeles in just a moment about that, but I'd like to ask briefly about New Orleans, whether you've managed to close that gap at all. Well, we believe uh, definitely that we have, not only uh, with the testing and again, going where people are, but also as it relates um, uh, to the vaccinations. Now, we have lost 770 of our residents to death due to COVID. 558 of them are African American. And so when it came to the vaccination, we had to ensure that, hey, those who are greatly are the most impacted need to be vaccinated first. So we began setting up uh, pilots and, and, um, and planning for mass distribution at the last quarter of 2020 so that we could be prepared again to stand up testing but vaccinations in areas again in neighborhoods that are the most vulnerable so we're now leading the country in terms of our residents who are vaccinated at 21 uh, percent and, and so we're going to continue to not only do the mass distribution sites, but it's the smaller mobile testing sites that have proven to be most effective and, and demonstrating that it's people who look like them that are getting the tests, you know, that are getting the vaccines. And that seems to be getting more and more.
of our people uh, turning out. At the mass distribution site, over 60% have been from our black and brown communities uh, to the city managed vaccine uh, sites. 50% uh, have been African American. So we're really uh, getting our folks to turn out. That is truly fascinating because, you know, demonstration effect in terms of trying to actually use social media or convey the message that actually both testing but also vaccination is not a white only thing. It actually is needs to go into all communities. It's critical. I'd like to bring in Mayor Garcetti at this point because um, you and I spoke, uh, Mayor Garcetti, a few months ago in relation to this. And back then you expressed your concern that there was this disparity between different communities in terms of the impact of COVID and we're trying to unveil policies to tackle that. Can you tell us what you actually did and whether it worked and how you may or may be rolling us out to impact the vaccine distribution as well? Absolutely, and great to be with you, Jillian, again. Um, thank you, Mayor Cantrell, my fellow brother mayors, Reese and, and Plato as well. Um, and let me start by saying we have to be conscious not just of disparities within our cities, but across the globe. And vaccine equity globally is a very important issue, I think, to all of us as um, the problems that we have in the United States are good problems to have compared to places that have barely started to vaccinate at all. And I think we all have to be committed to a global solution in all cities. But within Los Angeles, we're very proud of the work that we've done, uh, certainly when it came to testing. And we saw, for instance, the disparity between black deaths and black population in Los Angeles in the first month, like around the country, about double the deaths, um, sorry, double the number or percentage of deaths in the African-American community compared to the represented population, we were able to, after that first month, be one of the only cities in America that has cut deaths in the African-American community to under the represented population. And it was done really with you know, some very clear messaging, uh, truth tellers, trusted partners. And it's the same thing with vaccines now. And I call it the four T's. You need to tell the truth. These are safe. Uh, for instance, in black community, you can say the black woman was one of the people who developed um, the Pfizer vaccine, um, that this is second trusted messengers and trusted deliverers of the vaccine. Places where people already go and trust uh, the clinicians that are there, go to the neighborhood clinic, go to the, uh, yes, yeah, set up those mass centers and those mobile clinics that Mayor Cantrell talked about. Dr. Fauci just uh, looked at Los Angeles this week and said it was the best in the country he had seen. We've surged up almost 10 of those, um, and they're like a mega site on week. Deals. Uh, third, though, is technology. And you have to meet people where they are. For instance, in the Latino community, and, and my uh, family came both from uh, Eastern Europe as Jews fl fleeing Russia and from Mexico during the Mexican Revolution. Uh, my city is half Latino, but 60% of the cases have been the Latino community. Just 23% of the vaccines were reaching the Latino population. And it's not that we as Latinos are not connected but we're less likely to have the broadband connection, the laptop and desktop. So you have to be uh, really looking at mobile devices, calling people proactively. And what we do is when new appointments open up, we text certain zip codes with emergency notifications so that they can get that information, they can get those appointments as quickly as people living in Beverly Hills or Brentwood or a more uh, wealthy part of town. And the fourth T is transportation. You must help people get either by coming to them or to the mass vaccination sites, get a ride. So we've got 20,000 rides from Uber uh, that are either free or half off. We've got our uh, metro system helping people get there. Um, and we're developing that so that people, whether it's somebody with a disability in a dedicated lane for folks that are using paratransit or other things, you have to get them there. So we're very proud of what we're doing, but we still, I think in any city in the world and in America, we still have a long way to go. Right. I'm curious. I mean, just remind us again about those four T's that you used. Um, transport, so true, trust, truth, trust, um, truth, trust, technology, transport. Right. OK, well, that's a very good roadmap that I think many, many um, local authorities and municipal groups could actually embrace as well. Um, but I'm curious, um, Mayor Plato, as Mayor says, I mean, there is in some ways a case of you know, America having problems that the rest of the world will almost envy in terms of the degree that, that vaccinations are being distributed now. Um, how are you tackling this in Cape Town? You know, how did the COVID-19 pandemic hit people? Was there a great disparity between different communities? And how are you trying to overcome that with a vaccination program? Well, we're working very closely with our provincial government and our national government. Uh, they are the key entities dealing with the vaccination rolling out program 
uh, across South Africa. As you are aware, and or should be aware, um, lots and lots of the vaccine still needs to reach uh, South Africa. Um, we d definitely do not have enough. Um, and our government are still talking uh, to, to some of the foreign entities about that. Um, we just hope that our vaccines will arrive very, very quickly in the country so that we, we, we about 500,000 only in the whole of South Africa out of a population of 56 million have been vaccinated so far. And that, that is definitely not, not good enough. Um, our government, need, unfortunately, needs to do much, much more about it. But on other fronts, uh, the municipality, City of Cape Town, as a metropolitan municipality, likewise the other mayors, um, are doing its, its best uh, to assist the vulnerable, to assist the disadvantaged. We have vast, vast tracts of disadvantaged communities across South Africa, also in Cape Town, um, as you're aware. And um, uh, to assist them with regard to the socio-economical needs. Uh, we avail tens and tens of millions of rands uh, to, to that rolling out program to make sure that uh, the people, especially the poverty-stricken communities, receive the necessary aids in the form of food aid, in the form of COVID-19 packs aid, and, and so forth, that they have clean water, people in Koru. You must uh, realize that there's lots and lots of remote areas uh, across South Africa. We need to really do our level best to reach out to the vulnerable and make sure they have clean water every day, at least to wash their hands and that sort of thing. Um, we could get that right. We could get uh, food parcels out to people, uh, relief and that sort of thing. So we succeed in, in getting all of those done. Our convention center, international convention center in Cape Town, we transform that into a field hospital, uh, quite successful and uh, to house 800 patients uh, with the figures dropping with all these assistance uh, despite uh, vaccinations and etc. Um, the, the figures of South Africa and Cape Town particularly is coming down at a dramatic rate. We are very, very pleased about that. Um, so it seems to me um, we, we are busy flattening the curve and, and, and so forth. But, uh, um, and I believe that uh, the manner in which we have dealt with our, our reaching out aids to the most vulnerable and others out there, help a lot in flattening the curve. So it was a really a, a, a combination of efforts, of, of a combination of, of governmental entities uh, assisting, complementing one another. And uh, if that did not happen, we would have sitting with, uh, with, uh, with really a, a kind of a catastrophe uh, countrywide and also down here in beautiful Cape Town. It did not happen. Um, we are very chuffed about that. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, I mean, how do you possibly implement a shelter in place policy, say, in, um, you know, in a city where many people are living in very crowded accommodations and don't have the, you know, the potential to actually stay at home and shelter in place necessarily. Well, um, look, we, we, we look at all of, of, of those issues and uh, um, um, in the city of Cape Town, we appoint a, a, a what we call a high profile dedicated team to deal with all of those issues. People knowing exactly what to do and uh, decision makers. I, th I think the most important thing for us was um, uh, not uh, to, to get into a meeting kind of a stage every day, but the decision makers needed to take action. They needed to make on the spot decisions with regard to how to deal with those issues and it really work. Um, high profile decision makers, high profile uh, uh, people with the necessary know-how. Yelp was big time in overcoming those issues. Um, I can say to you right now, even if that did not happen, um, it would have been all over the world news uh, that we have lost the fight um, against uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Right. Um, Marvin, I'd like to turn to you at this point, um, Bear Rees, and ask you, um, as a fellow Brit, you know, I live in New York, but I have watched the UK government policy over the last year. It's been very shopping and changing. Um, it's gone back and forth quite a few times. Um, in sharp contrast to the way the policy has been created in New York, which has been very consistent. So I'm curious, 
With these confused messages uh, or changeable messages, how have you managed to keep um, your local community sort of focused on best practice? And given that so much of healthcare policy in the UK is centralized, um, what role is that for local um, networks or initiatives? When, on that question of governance, you, you've really put your finger on something that we think is a real challenge, not just for the way we respond to a pandemic, but the way countries are led at the moment anyway, that there are no levers in national capitals that you can just pull and get good outcomes uh, across the city, you need uh, across the countries. You need to make space for the dynamism, the local innovation, and the word trust has come up a lot. And I think the opportunity to build relationships of trust between institutions and local populations is stronger at the city level and the local level than it is between communities and, and national organisations. But straight out of the traps uh, with uh, COVID, we set up our own communications channels. Uh, we, uh, I, I did a weekly uh, press brief that we invited um, voluntary community sector organisations and businesses to. Uh, we pulled city leaders together, leaders of the universities, uh, business community, trade unions, and we would all meet once a week to get the, the accurate information, the latest information from our director of public health. Um, and then we'd already been working on a what we call a Bristol One City approach. So we uh, we had a, a citywide framework and a collection of relationships we were able to work with. Um, and so I think we set up our own relationships, talked about the principles of transmission. So not just not just putting restrictions in place, but making sure people understood that COVID spread person to person through droplets uh, um, and, and through shared contact with services. If you understand the principles, then we empower you to make better decisions about how you manage yourself, reduce risk that you pose to yourself and risk that you take into other people's lives. And we really took that kind of, a, that kind of citizen empowerment uh, approach in partnership with our local institutions. Right. Well, that raises a very interesting question, which I'd like to ask all of you, which is that in the aftermath of the pandemic, and let's all hope there will be an aftermath to the pandemic um, pretty soon, um, are you expecting in that aftermath for the relationship between cities and the wider national frameworks of governance to change? Do you think the cities will have an enhanced role going forward? Um, and should they have an enhanced role given what they've done? Um, maybe I can start with you, uh, Meg Garcetti, and then turn to Mayor Cantrell. Um, absolutely, Julian. I think that, uh, you know, I, I chair C40, uh, which is a, about the 100 largest cities in the world. I think all the mayors on this have participated in some of our programming or our member cities. And one of the things we did early on in the pandemic is I hit the bat signal and when Zoom was still a new thing. The most moving Zoom call I think of my life I've been on was about 45 mayors around the world as this virus started to spread. The mayor of Seoul telling us what testing was about. The mayor of Milan as people were dying in Northern Italian hospitals. The mayor of Delhi as he closed down the city. Um, and then a billion people followed in the country two days later. And that kind of convening of mayors made it very clear that cities were gonna be on the front line of responding to this, that we had the ability to act more quickly, step out of our lane, build things up. Like in Los Angeles, we've tested more people than any other government entity in the United States of America directly, whether that's state, county, city, or national. Um, and that afterwards, we are going to try to speak with a unified voice to our national governments to really demand that cities be listened to as we rebuild, because this isn't just about reacting and responding. It is about rebuilding. And as you heard Mayor Durkin say in the video leading up to this, reimagining the future, going bold with things. And I'm quite satisfied in the United States right now with the new administration that not only are they listening, but they listened for the past year and that the Biden-Harris administration together with this Congress isn't just looking at the health aspects, but is cutting child poverty in half in America, is looking at child care and tax credits to help the very poorest. It's inspiring us to go big and bold um, on things like a basic income, um, to look at you know what we've done with raising our uh, minimum wage or making community college free to inspire that at the national level. So I do think cities have earned their place at the national table. There's always politics, so it depends on the country. Sometimes national leaders want to kind of squat down um, local leaders. Um, but I think as long as we stay unified nationally and as we stay unified internationally, the evidence is clear, the brilliance is, and the innovation and the, the scars from this pandemic have been earned at the local level. So I think we have a right to talk about how national policy should move after the pandemic. Well, that's fascinating because I do find it remarkable, um, as I turned to you, Mayor Cantrell, 
that one of the things that was very striking about certainly the Anglo-Saxon world was the complete inability or unwillingness to learn lessons from elsewhere in the world in the early stages. There was a huge amount of hubris at the national level, both in London and in Washington, which caused tragic results. Um, whereas, as you say, the mayors were talking to each other and swapping ideas about best practices very early on in a way that got very little attention, but was very, very laudable in many ways. Um, I'm curious, Mayor Control, because you know you have so many lessons to tell other cities even before the pandemic hit about New Orleans experience. But do you think it's time to recognize the role that cities play more actively and give them more power in terms of developing policy? Oh, no, no doubt about it. And uh, Mayor Garcetti uh, alluded to this uh, under his leadership of C40, and I had the opportunity to uh, serve in that capacity as well. So um, communicating and collaborating with, with uh, leaders across the world absolutely gave us uh, just the, the momentum and the support uh, to just push through uh, and the courage, quite frankly. Um, but also here in the United States of America, through the U.S. Conference of Mayors, I, I have to go back to that as well. Um, us seeing how we were suffering on the front line, how um, our cities were even being cut out of the federal resources that were allocated and quite frankly set aside, supposed to be set aside on the front end uh, for local municipalities, but only to see firsthand that your city was doing what it what was necessary, you know, um, with resources and and uh, the 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 impact to your budget, you know, the deficits that you had to incur just to meet the expenses and the demands to fight and beat back the, you know, the virus, but at the same time, seeing at the state level to where your dollars were diverted. And so here in, in uh, the state of Louisiana, one example is that 800 million was supposed to go to local municipalities, but the state legislature redirected over 300 million and a city of New Orleans submitted expenses, 132 million, where 129 was approved but we only received 60 million of those dollars allocated um, at the state level. So through the U.S. Conference of Mayors, through us working together, we were able to carry that voice to this current administration who listened. And now with this package that was recently approved, well, our local governments are going to be met where we are and we're respected and appreciated for the work that we have done. So I am excited about what is to come uh, so that we can get our fair share of not only dealing with the losses, but even the expenditures that we continue you know, to incur uh, as we move towards recovery. Well, those are incredibly important points. And um, I think certainly it's gonna be very interesting to see how the new Biden administration does um, deal with the mayoral system. Because I know it's certainly got a different intention whether it can actually put that in the practice, we'll have to see. But um, to make sure this isn't too much of an inward-looking American conversation, I'd like to bring in both Mayor Reeves and then Mayor Plato. I mean, in the UK, the direction of almost every government um, reform in recent years has been for more centralisation um, and less powers towards local municipalities. Um, but do you think it's time to turn the tide and give a lot more power to the local governments? Because frankly, you know, the national government has not covered itself in glory in the last um, year. Well, from uh, the city of Cape Town side, um, let me say that um, the relationship between the three tiers of governments, uh, national, provincial and local, was, was pretty good. Um, we had uh, quite often engagements with our national counterparts and they realize on their own they will never be able to reach out to communities. So they realize immediately they need um, the local sphere. Um, looking at, uh, the, the, as I've said earlier, the spread of information, the spread of food aid, relief aid, um, social packages, um, what Mayor Eric have also uh, stated uh, before, um, 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 all the other um, issues uh, needed in, in communities and that sort of thing. Uh, municipalities across the world is in the same situation, the same boat. It is how you communicate to your public. Um, 
how do you spread the relief aid, who must get, who not, and that sort of thing is all very, very important issues on a localized level. And I think the collaboration, um, not to, to say you step on, on someone else's toes, but, but you know uh, and recognize the people in power, you recognize the mayors in power, you rely on their expertise, I think that's equally important and, and so on. And, uh, but at the end of the day, I'm quite happy with the fact that um, with our frontline workers, we could at least look uh, at our frontline people. Uh, we could see that our frontline people get uh, vaccinated uh, before anyone else and that sort of thing. And the communities respect that. Um, because uh, you, you, I don't need to say much more about frontline people, you know it all. But uh, at, at the end of the, of the day, um, I was quite chuffed and happy with the governance issues um, that crystallized itself out during that pandemic. Yes, there will always be some gaps. It is how you deal with the necessary gaps. But, but the beauty was uh, from time to time to receive a phone call from a national minister. The, the national minister is concerned with the pandemic, that sort of thing. And I think that is equally important. So on that level, uh, quite okay. Um, lastly, not so not so happy with the fact uh, that uh, we did not receive enough of the vaccine so that we can vaccinate our, our public and that sort of that needs still needs to come. Uh, but but okay. <laughs> right. What about you, Mary? Because I mean, obviously, there has been a shift in you know the green growing centralisation in the UK in recent years. But I'm curious, you know, do you expect that to change? And how does that play into the equity question? I mean, do you have the power as Mary's um, to actually help on the equity issue in Bristol? Well, first off, I just want to say thank you to Mayor Cantrell and Mayor Gossetti for the election result. It gives me some hope for the planet, <laughs> to be perfectly frank, over the last few years. Just, I don't know if that's diplomatic, but I was looking on. But anyway, apart from that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think... There's some real risks in the UK. There is a tendency to suck power into Westminster and London. Um, I think the, the I, I certainly, I'm a member of the Core Cities Network and there's been a growing conversation in the UK about the importance of real places, not what Professor Robin Hamilton calls placeless power that happens in the capital, but place-based power that has relationships uh, with real people. And we, we, you know, we've seen those conversations. Andy Burnham obviously uh, has, has, you know, has been on the forefront of that. And obviously there's an ongoing uh, you know, contest with, with uh, Mayor Sadiq Khan as well. Um, I think that one of the big threats to, uh, to that in the UK is actually increasing uncertainty, um, not just from COVID, but also from Brexit. And I think the more uncertain the future looks to our national government, the more they want to grab hold of power and the civil servants want to take control because they won't want to leave it to people who aren't necessarily directly accountable to them. So that's going to be a real tension. If that trend comes to dominate, and there isn't some what I would call humility within national uh, leaders, they will they will snuff out the potential leadership and innovation of cities and places. And can I just say there's two areas in which I think cities can really lead. Now, clearly, it's at the local level, right? What goes on inside city boundaries? How do we decarbonize our energy systems? How do we retrofit our homes, decarbonize our transport systems? That doesn't happen from buttons in national government. It happens at the local place level. That's where we write the plans. But I think what is less, uh, uh, less appreciated, but um, Mayor Garcetti's on the front end of, is cities have an international leadership role. And in many ways, we are now interdependent, right? National governments tend to work within borders and boundaries and see themselves as zero-sum self-interest. Cities recognize their interdependence. What happens in uh, um, Freetown is of immediate concern to me because I have Sierra Leoneans living in Bristol. Right? I've got Jamaican family, Jamaican-Americans. What goes on in Atlanta, in Los Angeles? My cousin is uh, one of Mayor Garcetti's <laughs> uh, citizens. That's of immediate concern to me. And we share populations. And I think in a, in a world in which so many of the challenges we face are pretty much post-national, city politics might be one of the best vehicles we have to engage in post-national politics. What we need is national governments and our international organisations like the UN to catch up with the potential of cities to be a new voice on the global policy stage. Right. I often think it's ironic that the only international body we have effectively is called the United Nations that puts all the emphasis on the nation state. Um, but I'm curious, to bring it back to the direction of the overarching conference about equity, 
any of you got thoughts to share in the last 10 minutes about what you can or will do coming out of COVID, specifically about how to create um, a more equitable city? Um, how do you hope to use the disruption of COVID to actually address that? I can see you're nodding enthusiastically, Mayor Cantrell. Any thoughts from you about how you really create a more equitable city? No, well, absolutely. Now, the city of New Orleans is um, a hospitality city, you know, destination city where it is the number one economic driver, uh, which this pandemic has crystallized the need to diversify our economy as well as move and pivot our people into higher wage uh, jobs. So definitely focusing on infrastructure and green and blue infrastructure opportunities, pivoting our people in terms of workforce training and development so that we can get off of hospitality being that ne that main industry. But again, in infrastructure and renewable energy platforms and uh, advanced manufacturing, this is just our opportunity to naturally pivot technology, transportation options and the like. So we're taking advantage of that. We're using our dislocated work worker dollar and, and training uh, more of our people that were formerly employed by hospitality and now they're into tech sales and they're like, who knew, you know, that uh, pitching the dessert, you know, or the special would would um, help me in terms of selling technology and earning a, wi a, a wage just, I mean, unsurmountable as it relates to what they received uh, pre-COVID. And so we're just trying to be as intentional as possible again, by meeting our folks where they are, but giving them the training and the tools that they need uh, to pivot into other growth sectors uh, and earn higher wages. And, and that has to remain a focus uh, for our city. Well, I'd like to ask each of you that question about how you create a more equitable city coming out of this, but Mayor Plato, from the point of view of Cape Town, any thoughts from the South African context? Yeah, no, definitely uh, diversity. Um, many, many different cultures, indigenous groupings and that sort of thing. Uh, people were coming from uh, extreme different backgrounds uh, from uh, the past uh, 27 years only in the new dispensation. We still have a long way to go after apartheid, bringing different cultures, people uh, of all walks of life together and that sort of thing to say to people, we are all just people. We are all just human beings. Uh, we need to get out of that closet of uh, uh, looking at each other's color of the skin. Uh, we all have our own sets of brain powers we bring to the table. And the moment we begin to recognize that, we are busy building a new nation and, and a, a building a new South Africa. And that is what Cape Town are trying to do. And I think we, it will still take us a long way to go. But at, the, at least you need to do something. You need to try. Um, if something in that respect is not working, you try something else. But you need to continue to put your shoulder against the wheel uh, to, to make sure that we create that uh, beautiful city uh, you after all want. Um, people need to be educated. People need to, to stay in school. It's no use you, you looking at other racial groups and to say they have this, they have that, but you sit backwards. Uh, you don't want to finish your studies and that sort of thing. So there's a couple of other uh, issues, uh, the disadvantage, poverty stricken people also need to do, but government needs to provide them with the necessary uh, opportunities, uh, the necessary means and ways of how to get there. And um, I think our government, our provincial government, our national government, also us as a city lo on a localized level, we um, realize that. And uh, that is why we're doing things in a very specific manner to realize uh, our ultimate goals. Thank you. Right. Mayor Rees, and then I'll turn to Mayor Garcetti at the end. Mayor, Mayor Rees. Well, I, I think the big opportunity that we have now is to realize that equity is not just a kind of a peripheral social justice issue is a nice to have, but is actually central to building resilience. Uh, we've seen that, uh, you know, obviously lower income people, more vulnerable, poor quality housing have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, they, and what, what that vulnerability within our economy done is, is, is actually close the economy down. So if we want to be more resilient, we have to, whether we do it because we want to do it or as we have a sole commitment to it or just because we are being strategically minded, is make sure that we're tackling those inequalities. Remembering that with a shock like COVID, the longer the virus is out there, the more opportunity it has to mutate. 
So there's some very real direct. This is the this is the embodiment of what Desmond Tutu called Ubuntu, isn't it? You know, we can only be until we when, once uh, once we all are. In terms of direct policy, um, I'm I still emphasise the need to build affordable homes for people in balanced communities, mixed ten-year communities. Housing to me is a pathway to tackling uh, food poverty, fuel poverty. Uh, having mixed tenure communities can help share um, aspirations, but also making sure that people get uh, more uh, better access to good quality schools because they are genuinely mixed, which feeds into challenges of social justice. There's many more things we need to do about digital exclusion and skills development and hunger, but we, our emphasis in the city is very much on delivering affordable homes in mixed communities. Right. Well, thank you. Well, I must say the point you make about the fact that you know humanity is connected through a global chain. And if the weakest link of that chain breaks, it has a nasty habit of affecting all of us, has been shown so clearly in the pandemic, where not even the rich can entirely barricade themselves into um, citadels where germs can't get to. Um, so whether it's through self-interest or a general sense of a conscience, you know, this issue of equity matters enormously. But um, Meg Arsetti, um, what are your thoughts about what a city like Los Angeles can do to really try and tackle inequity afterwards? and what the wider messages might be. Well, what a joy this has been, by the way. And thank you to, to Dan and to Marvin and to Latoya and to you, um, because I always get great ideas listening to my fellow mayors and this conversation is so critical. Uh, I think there's our, our residents can't wait to get out, to go to a restaurant, a nightclub, um, maybe go see a movie. We as policymakers can't wait to unleash a bunch of policies of equity post pandemic. And I think we're all excited and have that same hunger that our citizens do, but it's in, around policies that work. And to me, they're really around a fairer economy. They're about um, more racial justice and they're about making sure that we have resilient communities. Um, and what COVID has laid out is for me, COVID isn't some outlier once in our lifetime thing. If you're poor or a person of color or you live in the wrong neighborhood, you have a COVID equivalent every single day of economic downturn, of health conditions, and even yes, of death. Maybe we can't bring the statistics together as dramatically, but they've been out there in a city like mine, a country like mine, and so many parts of the world every single day. That's what inequality is about. Marvin said it so beautifully, equity isn't a side issue. It has to be the prism through which we refract everything. In Los Angeles, that means going big and bold, testing a basic income with some of our poorest uh, residents, which is something we're gonna do trying to make transit free. We're gonna to try to become the largest transit body in the United States to make transit free uh, for over 80% of our riders. A right to housing, which is the only way we'll end homelessness in cities like mine. Um, and at the national level, working on that with, with President Biden. Non-armed responses to things like mental health crises that don't require a police officer that we're gonna be funding 24 seven with vans that roll out. A youth development department and the employment of young people, um, especially standing up out of this pandemic. Uh, bold infrastructure investments, helping our small businesses, especially of color, get the technology and the connections to stand back up again after this. LA's Green New Deal, which mirrors many global Green New Deals to really connect a new energy economy uh, and environmental justice with jobs. Um, and even bold things like looking at reparations and a study to see whether we can find a way to finally erase the centuries um, that have piled up against people of color uh, by bringing resources to communities to transform them. We have to reimagine, not just respond, not just rebuild, but this is the moment to do it. And I couldn't be more excited to do it alongside these mayors um, and local communities in my city as well. Well, thank you all very much indeed. And I should say, I couldn't be more thrilled to have been moderating this debate because as I said at the beginning, talking to mayors is always something which is very um, encouraging, if not a source of optimism in these times. Even before pandemic, the pandemic hit, I used to enjoy it because it was one of the few flashpoints of um, debate, which was not wildly bipartisan in terms of getting, wildly partisan in terms of getting stuff done in America. But I think in the last year, this point about pragmatic rolling up the sleeves action and international collaboration and a willingness to learn from each other and connect with each other is extremely important um, because as Mary said we are living in a some ways post-national world where everybody can learn from everybody else um, but sadly has sometimes been rather slow to do so. So I hope that anyone watching this will take the messages away not just about the practical messages to do with equity and how to build it in cities but also the other message 
that there is a class of political leaders out there who are fighting to try and implement practical policies and move forward as fast as they can in the aftermath of the pandemic. So thank you all very much indeed for your time. Best of luck in implementing what you're hoping to implement and um, look forward to checking back with you in the future to see how it has played out. And in the meantime, for all those watching, we now have a message from Mayor Khan, Sadiq Khan of London, about what's happening in his global city and how London is or is not planning to rise through challenges of equity. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's Sadiq Khan here, the Mayor of London. I'm pleased to be able to share this message from across the pond. I want to start by thanking the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, not only for organising this important event, but for facilitating the international exchange and cooperation that we know is so crucial to overcoming COVID-19. The truth is, we can't just move on from this crisis or return to business as usual once it's over. Contrary to earlier speculation, COVID-19 hasn't proved to be a great leveller. Instead, women, working class communities, disabled people and people of colour have been hit the hardest. In London, we took immediate action to try to mitigate the impact on our most vulnerable citizens. From supporting community organisations working with marginalised Londoners to getting homeless people off the streets, there's no question that what we did helped to protect public health and save both lives and livelihoods. But the truth is, we were always swimming against the tide because not only were we responding to a deadly pandemic, but we were also dealing with inequalities and injustices that had been decades in the making. The reasons why specific communities and certain groups of people have been more badly affected by this virus are undeniably complex. They range from deep-seated inequalities in health and housing to major disparities in income and employment, not to mention the insidious effects of structural racism and the consequences of outdated attitudes towards disabled people and women. And yet, the conclusions we must draw from this tragic experience are very simple. They are that the difference between keeping or losing your job should never again be determined by your gender. The difference between a high quality of life and a life of loneliness and isolation should never again be determined by your age or a disability. And the difference between life and death should never again be determined by your social class or skin colour. These are the lessons we must learn from this crisis and they're already guiding our plans for London's recovery. We're putting the values of equality, diversity and inclusion at the heart of our policy making with nine recovery missions that are designed to help fix the structural flaws in our society and economy as well as make our city a fairer, greener and more just place to live. From strengthening our social safety net to creating new well-paid jobs in the green economy. Of course this isn't going to be easy but we owe it to our communities who've suffered and sacrificed so much over the last year to give it everything we've got. And I look forward to working with all of you to make this vision a reality as we pursue our common goal of a future where no one is left behind, where racial justice and gender equality are secured and where everyone in our cities is truly able to flourish and thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian, and Mayors Contrell, Garcetti, Plato, and Reese for sharing your insights on how cities are working to ensure an equitable recovery from the virus. And thanks to Mayor Khan for sharing his perspective from London. Now that we've heard from a number of global cities, let's turn to another key component of urban life, an issue of prime importance to ensuring equity in cities 
and one that has been greatly affected by the pandemic, the issue of transportation. Major city mass transit systems have seen their ridership decline by upwards of 70%, and yet they remain the lifeblood of cities, critical for essential workers and low-income residents, and central to reinvigorating our cities. For a look at national transportation policy and the pivotal role cities will play moving forward, it's my pleasure to introduce Jeanette Sadi Khan, former commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation and now a principal at Bloomberg Associates. Jeanette will lead a powerhouse discussion with former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, and now our secretary of transportation, Pete Buttigieg. And Secretary Buttigieg will be joined by the CEO of Los Angeles Metro, Philip Washington. Well, it's great to be with everybody here today. Um, we are living in unprecedented times. We are dealing with a health emergency, an economic emergency, a moment of racial reckoning. As my friend Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation has said, it's like living in 1918, 1932, and 1968 all at the same time. We're also facing a transportation and infrastructure emergency, one that is hitting Americans very differently. While many of us work from home, millions of essential workers still had to commute every day to service jobs and jobs along the supply chain. And these workers we all counted on were also those that were more likely to come from black and brown communities and less likely to own cars and be more dependent on transit services that were cut during the pandemic. In many ways, 2020 made clear what's always been true. Transportation policy is economic policy, it's environmental policy, it's equity policy. It's about access, access to healthcare, to schools, to jobs, to opportunities. But even before the pandemic, our transportation system was broken. It was dangerous with 42,000 deaths and almost 5 million people in seriously injured every year. It was deteriorating. According to a recent report from the American Society of Civil Engineers, there's a $786 billion backlog in just maintaining the bridges and roads and tunnels that we have. It's unhealthy with emissions from cars being the number one cause of US pollution. And too many people don't have reliable transit, don't have city sidewalks or safe crossings, and biking is nearly impossible in many cities. And now at the center of all this is Secretary Pete Buttigieg, the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, who was sworn in as transportation secretary just last month. As someone who's worked for a mayor, I have great appreciation for mayoral innovation and hustle, hallmarks of Mayor Pete's tenure. And it's been good seeing you riding bikes and fighting for Amtrak, and I'd love to see you ride the New York City subways when you are running for president. Mr. Secretary, as I've just outlined, transportation is much more than cars and trucks and things that go. Millions of Americans are still out of work and we are not out of the pandemic yet. How can transportation policy help ensure that the recovery reaches everybody, especially the black and brown communities who've been left out since long before the pandemic? Well, thanks for such an important question. Thanks for your work, which I've long admired and, and for the chance to be here. I think your question goes right to the heart of where we are right now not only a problem of historic proportions, but a historic opportunity to deliver solutions. Look, we're at a moment where, as you pointed out, we're approaching a trillion dollar backlog in terms of uh, work that we need to do just to maintain and responsibly look after what we've already got. And we know that we've got to go beyond that in order to make sure that we have the resources that communities need for the road ahead. We also know that other countries are getting ahead of us. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you look at the investments that uh, China is making, more than the US and Europe combined right now on infrastructure. Add to that the fact that there is a history of federal policy that has not only sometimes let some communities down, 
has sometimes actively made things worse for many communities, disproportionately black and brown Americans in the neighborhoods they live in. So just as sometimes investments in things like great sidewalks or good transit resources failed to come to a neighborhood uh, where most people were living in a minoritized or disempowered group, sometimes the investment came to that neighborhood in the form of, for example, a highway dividing it. Now's our chance to do something about that. Knowing that we have no choice but to make big investments in our infrastructure, we also have to make those new investments in more equitable ways than what we had before. That's the significance of the Justice 40 initiative in the Biden-Harris administration. Justice 40 because 40% 40 of our investment is being directed to those who have been historically excluded or disinvested in the past. Now, another thing that I think will be very important as we undertake the kind of infrastructure investments that I hope and believe are ahead is to think about the jobs that are being created to deliver those investments. What kind of businesses, what kind of workers are getting to do the work that we are about to create? We've got to be intentional about that. It's not a simple challenge, but it's an incredibly important one. Now, we're not waiting for big infrastructure bills to pass in order to act. In, in my first 30 days, we've already been uh, taking the steps that we can with the discretion that I have here at the Department of Transportation. Just to give you one example, uh, the infra grants, formerly known as uh, Fastlane, when the notice went out on those funding opportunities uh, in hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of grant funding, we made very clear that we expect communities applying for that funding to consider and present what they can do for issues of climate and for issues of racial and economic equity as part of their planning. And I think that's a down payment on what we might be able to do going forward. So bottom line, you cannot talk about infrastructure policy without talking about equity. And now's a chance to do right by both of those imperatives. Mr. Secretary, I have to say it's such a breath of fresh air to be to hear about investments being driven by outcomes and not just continuing to do the same things over and over again and expecting different results. So you talked about the invest, the infrastructure investments ahead and intentional investments. And I wonder, you know, with less than half of Americans having access to public transit today, uh, you know, when he was running for president, Joe Biden campaigned on a goal of bringing public transit to all American cities with 100,000 people or more by 2030. I wonder, how will you do that? And how do you see access to transit as an equity policy? Well, we've got to recognize that safety isn't just about technological features on vehicles. It's about how we design our communities, how we design our neighborhoods and our streets to make sure people have safe options and good ways to get around. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, far too many Americans don't have access to transit at all. Uh, and again, there are a lot of issues of racial equity at stake here. Uh, certainly black and, and, and brown people are much more likely to face serious injury or uh, fatalities walking and biking. So we've got to make sure that we are supporting communities, which often know better than uh, we might here in Washington exactly what they need. Not all of the answers have to come from Washington, but a lot more of the resources should. It's about recognizing that one size won't fit all. For some communities, what's really needed is a subway stop with transit-oriented development happening around it. For another community, the most important thing might be just making sure that there are adequate sidewalks uh, to get kids to school and then encouraging, as we would in South Bend, uh, using safe routes to school resources uh, delivered through federal policy, uh, to do things like walking school buses to encourage that, uh, that process of a community uh, uh, taking people to taking kids to where they needed to go and encouraging kids uh, to form uh, healthy and safe habits in terms of how they get around and get to school. Uh, this is a dollars and cents issue. It's part of what's uh, at stake in our uh, conversation this year about infrastructure. But it's also a question of whose interests are being considered, uh, including those who haven't had a voice, whether we're talking about children or whether we're talking about communities that have been politically disempowered in the past. You know, those are such important points that you just made. And we're actually fortunate to be joined by Phil Washington, who is a visionary leader and the outgoing CEO of LA Metro. He had a highly successful tenure in uh, Denver, running the transit agency there, and he's an old friend. Um, Phil, since 2015, you've managed one of the nation's largest transit agencies with 11,000 employees and some $20 billion in infrastructure projects underway right now. 
you're exceptional in this industry in that you're a black man from the south side of Chicago running a major transit agency in an industry that's overwhelmingly white. And transportation inequity and the lack of access to transit are problems in many cities across this nation. I wonder if you've experienced this yourself and do you think that black needs are represented in transportation planning and how do you see your role in addressing it? Well, first of all, Jeanette, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, great to see you again, and I'm uh, thrilled to be on with the Secretary. I think uh, Secretary Buttigieg is going to be a fantastic uh, Secretary of Transportation. Um, uh, great question. I, I am not just a CEO, of course. I am, uh, as you said, a black man with a black son. Uh, I have a lived experience. I'm a, a child of the Civil Rights Movement. My mother took me to marches. Uh, and uh, once again, we're having that conversation with ourselves as it relates to uh, inequities uh, uh, in this country. Uh, and many of those are around transportation infrastructure. Uh, the secretary talked about our history around this. Um, being from the south side of Chicago, and I must have a shout out for my community, Argyle Gardens, uh, and this is something that uh, I talked to my friend Dorval Carter at the Chicago Transit uh, uh, Authority a lot about the extension uh, of the red line uh, to provide opportunities for people that are living in public housing. Um, I, I think uh, when we begin to talk about um, whether we have good representation in our communities, I don't think we do. Uh, you know, when, when you talk about uh, the opportunity to plan one's own community, that is a very, very important thing. When we talk about things like local hire, uh, when I was a kid, uh, I saw people building infrastructure in my community that did not look like me. Uh, and when I uh, went to find a job, I was either told one or two things, that you're not trained or you're too late. Uh, and so how great would it be uh, if you are planning uh, and designing your own community, how powerful would that be? And so the opportunity here uh, to operationalize equity becomes very, very important, at least in my mind. That's kind of what we're doing out here uh, in Los Angeles. And I'd also say in, in terms of sort of my perspective on uh, the civil unrest and what has happened over the last year or so. Um, hey, black lives do matter. Uh, and it's important to say that because constitutionally, there was a time when black lives did not matter. Uh, when a black man was three fifths human. Uh, and so I think when we look at infrastructure uh, and not just transportation infrastructure, but all kinds of infrastructure, I think we have to realize that we are really, uh, I like to say, a socioeconomic enabler. I mean, I can remember when uh, my sister uh, took a bus in the city of Chicago from one end of Chicago uh, to go to college. The first person in our family going to college took her two and a half hours to get from one end of Chicago to the other end of Chicago to go to school. She did it every day for four years. And all of us had to chip in for that. So I think uh, what we're doing here and, and what the secretary is talking about is so relevant uh, to all communities, to include tribal nations as well. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the issues I'm going to ask both of you, you know, keeping trains, this transit is such a critical lifeline for so many communities. You know, and Phil, you know, keeping trains and buses running is a challenge even when things are good. You know, and it's especially difficult during a health crisis. And, you know, as the secretary knows, ridership is down almost 80 percent nationally. It's down 50 percent on L.A. Metro. So how do we see this playing out? What do we think is the key to getting riders to come back to transit, to to come back to Metro? Well, I think one of the things we have to do, uh, obviously, is we have to regain the confidence uh, of riders out there. Uh, there are uh, essential workers. I mean, we see a lot of them, not just here in Los Angeles, but all over uh, the country. And they kept riding. Now, at reduced numbers, we know that. But they kept riding. Uh, we typically uh, move about 1.2 million people a day on our system. We got down to about 300,000. 
uh, we're back up to about 700,000, 650, 700,000 a day, and it's climbing. Uh, we need uh, the public's confidence, renewed confidence. We need to focus on strength and cleaning protocols. We need to focus on uh, mask wearing, mask mandates. Uh, and we also need to focus on air ventilation on buses and trains. Uh, and so I think if we focus on those things, which we're doing, and of course the vaccinations, uh, the program, the president has been doing a fantastic job um, with that. Uh, I think we will have that ridership come back. But I will say this, ridership cannot be our only metric of effectiveness. There are obviously uh, environmental benefits. There are so many other benefits. We have been hooked on uh, that metric for years and years and years. It is important, we know that, uh, but we need to include more metrics. And I will say as well, uh, Jeanette, uh, that I have said, uh, and we are working on a fairless initiative here in Los Angeles too. I've said that we, that I believe we've got a moral obligation uh, to the most diverse county in America uh, to pursue a fairless system uh, to sort of unburden them from the effects of the pandemic right now. And so we're pushing that forward and I think uh, just in my mind, I think that is the future of transit, a fairless system. That's really interesting. And, and you know, Mr. Mr. Secretary, you've also spoken of, you know, generational opportunities to transform transportation. Does this mean rethinking how we fund transportation with long-term investments in, in public transit, rethinking the agenda, looking at walking and biking to give people more affordable alternatives to driving? What does that mean in, in, for you? Yeah, I think it's all of the above and more. Actually, let me just take a second because this is my first chance uh, publicly to thank Phil Washington for his leadership of the agency review team, which uh, helped prepare me for this role during the transition. So uh, very much in your debt uh, for the expertise and, and leadership you brought there. And, and so glad that, that we're together now. Um, uh, to your question, Jeanette, yes, th this is our opportunity to think big and think whole. Uh, about what it means to have infrastructure serving everybody, empowering everyone to thrive in a way that would make us proud looking back 20 or 100 years from now. Uh, now, what does that actually look like in terms of the issues that, that we're going after? Well, of course, economic strength. Uh, equitable economic development and equity and justice writ large. Getting ahead of this climate challenge. Look, if transportation is the biggest contributor of greenhouse gases of any sector in the U.S., then it's poised to be the biggest part of the solution too. And this is our chance to position American families and workers and small businesses to compete and thrive in an increasingly complicated global economy, even if we're just looking after how somebody moves around their own neighborhood. We're always gonna be focused on safety first, and sometimes, uh, again, that involves an elaborate technological solution. Sometimes it's just making sure that we fill the hole in the road. Uh, we've got to be ready to balance the old and the new, the responsible stewardship of the assets that we've already got that have been systematically disinvested in for a generation, and the ability to look to things that weren't possible before and deliver them. I'm convinced that there is a once in a lifetime combination of factors right now. Uh, an impatient public, a level of bipartisan interest and attention, a demonstrated need, historically low interest rates, and a supportive president that could make this the moment to do what needs to be done for the foreseeable and unforeseeable future in America. That's what we have a chance to do something about. And that goes to everything from micro mobility, uh, how a scooter or a bike can be uh, available to somebody to safely get to work, all the way through to some of the most futuristic and, and, and complex technologies imaginable that might reshape what transportation looks like a generation from now. Well, that's very exciting. And I wanna thank both of you for um, being in this discussion today, Mr. Secretary, for the moonshot for mobility that we're going to be seeing from the administration and uh, Phil for your leadership in LA, which has been so transformative, not only in LA, but as an example to uh, cities around the country and indeed around the world. Uh, I think we are in a unique moment, um, poised to achieve the kind of outcomes that the Secretary has talked about, that the President has talked about, and 
really make infrastructure real and not just a hashtag or a punchline, um, which it's been for far too long uh, in recent years. So thank both of you um, and look forward to continuing the conversation soon. Thank you. Before we move to our final segment, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at underscore Global Cities. As the vaccine rollout continues in the United States and many countries around the globe, we have cause to be hopeful. The CDC recently released guidelines for fully vaccinated individuals and families on how to interact with one another, both those who are vaccinated and those who have not yet gotten the vaccine. And the COVAX facility delivered its first vaccine doses in Africa. Yet, at the same time, new variants of the virus have emerged in Brazil, in South Africa, the United Kingdom, and even in Los Angeles, giving new cause for concern. I had the pleasure of sitting down last week with Dr. Anthony Fauci to discuss the global vaccine rollout and his projections for the future of the pandemic. Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for joining us and, and thank you for everything that, uh, that you have done over the past year and over your many years uh, dealing with diseases and this pandemic in, in particular. Um, I, I wanted to start uh, talking for a bit about uh, the race between the vaccine and the variants uh, and uh, the importance of getting as many vet people vaccinated, uh, not only in the United States, but really globally. Uh, as possible in order to ensure that more dangerous variants uh, don't emerge and, and, and uh, defeat the vaccine. Can you talk a little bit about this relationship uh, be between vaccines and the longevity of the disease and how, it, how they might, uh, the virus might mutate and become sure. a, a problem? Uh, yes, I think the fundamental principle that people need to understand is that viruses do not mutate unless they replicate. Uh, and replication means spreading through different communities, particularly in people who might be immunosuppressed where the virus stays in their body a long time and gets immunological pressure to mutate. The best way to prevent that is to get, is to prevent the spread of infection. You, you, you prevent the spread of infection by two ways, by adhering very carefully to the public health measures that we recommend that so commonly heard the uniform masking, uh, the distancing, the avoiding congregate settings, particularly indoors, washing of hands. But importantly, now that we have safe and effective vaccines to get as many people vaccinated as quickly and as expeditiously as possible. It is also important to appreciate some subtleties and nuances. And that is, even if you get vaccinated against the virus that is now circulating in the community and a variant comes in, if you have a high enough level of antibodies because the vaccine induces a really good immune response, you may not get protected against infection with the variant, but you almost certainly will be protected against getting serious disease, including hospitalizations and death. And that's exactly what we saw in the J&J &J trial that took place in South Africa, in which the efficacy was not as high as it was for example, in the United States, but the dangerous uh, variant, the one that is predominant in South Africa, the B1351, that one did not cause any hospitalizations or death because of the vaccination. So vaccines can be good, one, to prevent you from actually getting infected, two, from preventing you from getting symptomatic disease, and even when you don't have a, a di direct match between the vaccine and the variant, the vaccine could still be helpful, very helpful in preventing you from getting very severe disease resulting in hospitalizations and death. With regard to your other question, which is very important, if we do not get the entire world protected against infection, that what will happen is that we could do a really good job in the United States or in the UK or in the European Union and yet, if in some of the middle and lower income countries in Southern Africa, in South America, in the Caribbean, if they don't get vaccinated, the, vac the virus can still smolder in those areas and ultimately mutate, come back to a country that seems to be well protected because of a vaccine, 
and make it very problematic because you can get reinfected with a, vac with a virus even if you've been uh, infected once before if the virus is substantially different. So A, get people vaccinated as quickly and as expeditiously as possible. B, a global pandemic requires a global response. So we need to take a look at the rest of the world and make sure that we pull together as a global community to suppress this. Otherwise, the variants will continue to recycle and be problematic. So I, I, I think this global piece is, is sometimes forgotten, particularly in our, in our own domestic debate, uh, and, it, and it is so important. And I think it was uh, yourself who, who announced uh, to the WHO that we were coming back in, but also we're going to join COVAX earlier this year, this international effort to get vaccines to uh, people who, who don't have the same uh, financial and other resources as we may have. So how are we going to make sure that enough vaccines are not only going to be uh, provided here in the United States, but around the world? How are we going to make sure that we beat those variants from emerging uh, in the other parts of the world by having uh, vaccines coming there as fast as possible? And, and should we think about perhaps uh, sharing more of our own vaccine uh, uh, load uh, and, and the rich countries in particular, uh, providing that to the poorer countries so more people are vaccinated around the world more quickly, not only from an equity perspective, but ultimately from a global health perspective. Yeah. Well, the first step, and I'm not going to get into the second or third step, I'm going to leave that to the president and others who are involved in that. But the first step is is a really good step that we took. Namely, we joined COVID. And as you mentioned, I had the privilege of being the one to announce at the executive committee of the World Health Organization that A, we're coming back into the WHO, and B, we're joining COVAX. Next, the president has pledged $4 billion, $2 billion now and $2 billion in the future. What we do with the doses, I'm going to be leaving that to the evolving plan that we have about how we can help be part of the global solution. But I think you'll be hearing about more about that in the future. Uh, but it is just uh, apart from where it's going to come from, it, it is important that we get to as many people around the world uh, as, as quickly as possible for that, uh, for that reason. That is true. Yeah. That is true. Uh, talk a little bit, if you will, about how we should think about uh, the future of this pandemic, the future of this disease. Um, there's this sense that once everybody is vaccinated, we'll go back to, to, to the normal from before. Is that how you see the disease evolving and our, our lives evolving? Will we all be able to, to, you know, watch the World Series and hopefully the Nationals or the Cubs or whoever are going to be in it uh, in, in person and we can go back to normal? Or do you think there is a constant back and forth between vaccines, variants uh, in this disease as it evolves? How should we think about the future? What's our new normal? Like? You know, I think that's unpredictable. It's unpredictable because... It's going to depend on how many people we do vaccinate in this country. I mean, if we get a degree of vaccine hesitancy where there are people who don't want to get vaccinated, we could have a smoldering situation in our own country, even if we're successful in getting the overwhelming majority of people vaccinated and we get a level of virus that's very, very low. Right now, the baseline is smoldering between 50,000 and 70,000 per day. It was as high as over 300,000 a day not too long ago. We've got to get it down to a very, very low baseline. Once we get there, then we can have a step-by-step -step progression towards normality in our own country. Hopefully, that will be as we get to the fall, mid-fall, early winter of this year. That is conceivable if we do things right, if we get people vaccinated, if people that adhere to the public health measures and don't jump the gun and see the levels go down and all of a sudden abandon all public health measures, which would be really quite detrimental and could lead to a rebound, that would be the first step to normality. The preservation of normality would be how we handle it globally, namely what we were just discussing a moment ago, how we get the rest of the world to have such a containment and control of the virus that we don't have a cycling that every year we have to be chasing against variants. We cannot predict that unless we actually do the things that need to be done, which what we said, public health measures, including an efficient and effective way 
to get as many people vaccinated as we possibly can. Dr. Fauci, thank you so much. Those are uh, wise words uh, on, on the public health measures and getting vaccinated. It's not only important for ourselves, it's important for everyone else. So appreciate uh, you being with us and thank you so much. My, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Today, we heard sobering news about the disproportionate effects of the virus on already vulnerable populations. We heard how 558 of the 770 COVID deaths in New Orleans were African-American and how only half a million of the 56 million residents of South Africa have so far been vaccinated. But we also heard from global mayors about how they took care of their most vulnerable populations, leveraging existing initiatives and organizations to mobilize quickly and how they plan to create more equitable cities as they recover. We learned how cities plan to reimagine, not just respond and rebuild after the virus, from reskilling service workers in New Orleans, to providing clean water in Cape Town, to building affordable housing in Bristol. We heard about the importance of transportation in equitable urban life, about LA's plans for the country's largest fareless system, and from the Secretary of Transportation on his moonshot for mobility. We also heard about vaccine equity and the need to deliver more vaccines to developing countries. As Mayor Plato of Cape Town said, we are all just people, we're all just human beings. Or as Mayor Garcetti of LA put it, equity isn't a side issue. It has to be the prism through which we reflect everything. We're now a year into a global pandemic that has shaped the way we live, work, interact, and even understand ourselves, as well as our cities. The questions the crisis has brought front and center in our lives and in our policies are all heart ones, but they must be addressed. We cannot ignore the plain truths about who was most affected by the virus itself and by the economic consequences of how we responded. Here at home, we cannot pretend life will go back to the way it was pre-COVID. We must imagine and pursue a new normal one that acknowledges the disparities we have witnessed and that seeks to rectify them in some meaningful and true ways. And globally, we must act from the understanding that a global pandemic requires a global response. The Pritzker Forum and other events like it are real opportunities to come together and work collectively to address this and other global challenges. Our next live stream program of the Pritzker Forum on Global Cities will be this summer. In the meantime, visit globalcitiesforum.org for more information and be sure to sign up for our monthly newsletter to receive regular updates. Thank you to today's speakers and moderators, to our sponsors, and to everyone who spent the last few hours with us. We know you have a lot of choices for where you engage, especially in the digital age, and your support makes our work possible. For now, stay safe, and we hope to see you soon.